welcome to the Rock in the Journey podcast and our conversations with inspirational women. So my guest today is one of Britain's most distinguished lawyers who has spent a professional life giving voice to those who have least power within the system. She has been called a petite fireball who grew up in Glasgow, the Glasgow tenements, and she has been a ferocious champion of women's issues, civil liberties and human rights. She is also a broadcaster, an author and Labour member of the House of Lords. She is the director of the International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute and was principal of Mansfield College in Oxford and the founder, founder of the Bombario Institute for Human Rights also in Oxford. So welcome Baroness Helena Kennedy. Great to it's have you on here yeah. today. <laughs> Now, Helena, um, one thing that's really important, that has always been really important to me and to our community is um, helping other women up, social mobility. And I was just talking to my daughter before you came on. Um, she's a 28 year old businesswoman. And I was telling her about you. And whenever I do an interview like this, I always think about that person that I want to, to send some messages to, and it would be her and her friends. So um, that, that, that age when they're just getting into their senior positions. So I wanted you to tell us about your background and how you started, because it was a very unusual start for, for a senior lawyer. Well, I, I, it was unusual at the time, and thank God things have changed a lot, Deborah, because um, uh, now many more people are going to university, and many more women, in fact. Our universities are full of fabulous young women, and, uh, and that has been a big change in my lifetime, because when I went uh, uh, on to higher education, I... Um, uh, it was still comparatively uh, rare for, for certainly for girls from working class backgrounds uh, to go to university. Um, uh, the, the other thing was that certainly it was very rare to go into law. And when I qualified as a barrister, there were only 6% um, of those who were qualifying for the bar were women. And so it, it just tells you about how times have changed. Our law schools now have got you know, more than 50% uh, are young women. Uh, women are in the majority in law schools, in medical schools, in, in many of the professions. Um, uh, the, the, the problems come later and we can talk about that but but for me it was it was it was a step into another world and uh, and it felt incredibly foreign to me and it was full of young men from very privileged backgrounds um, and they were um, and there was very little diversity at all in terms of ethnic minorities and so forth it was pretty homogenous and it was very much a certain kind of young man who'd usually gone to very privileged schools and so forth so um, that leap was a, was, a, was a big one. And at first I was hugely intimidated by it. I'm not gonna pretend that I wasn't. I was, and I listened and people spoke in voices that I had only ever heard on the radio um, and sounded incredibly posh. And I thought, oh my God, I don't belong here. And, I, and I, for probably the first month or so, I didn't even open my voice when I was in tutorial classes and so on, um, because I thought I'd say something completely stupid and, that, and I must've got there by mistake. Um, but in fact, of course, you gain your confidence and then you start realizing that some of the people who speak in those grand voices are not that smart after all. <laughs> and, so, and so slowly but surely I began to realize that actually maybe I did have something to offer here. Um, but the other thing was that I wanted to make a difference and, I, um, and, and in some ways you can be liberated by being different um, mm. because... Uh, can I just um, point like, there, because that's such an interesting idea, because a, a, a lot of the, the women we coach talk about this idea about how difficult they find it being an outsider and yeah. how they do hold their ground in, in situations where they might be. The, but I mean, a more senior, perhaps sometimes still the only woman or, or certainly different in some way. And it's one thing we hear a lot of is this kind of outsider issue. So mm. how did you cope with that, so especially as such a young woman? I mean, you were in your early 20s. Well, well, well at, at first it was hard and, and sets of chambers used to say things like that. We don't take women. They, they actually had 
a policy where they, they thought that women shouldn't be barristers and uh, and it wasn't the, the, the right kind of life for a woman. And they also felt that um, sets of chambers used to feel that, you know, why invest a whole lot of time in, in young women who are going to end up going off and getting married and having children and not, you know, there'll be no returns from them. So there really wasn't much enthusiasm for women going into practice. Mm -hmm. And I had to really twist arms and persuade people, please take me on um, as a pupil barrister because they really weren't very enthusiastic about doing that. Um, and then, um, you know, slowly but surely change started to take place. Um, but, uh, but I was, um, I went to the bar in the 70s. And, and you've got to remember that a huge journey has taken place in the lives of women, even in that uh, space of time in, in my life at the bar, because um, so many more have gone to university. And that's been a great uh, thing. But being an outsider, in some ways can make you different enough that you become memorable. And so I used to, um, uh, when once I got my pupil, started, I did my pupillage, then I started um, trying to look for a place in chambers and that was very, very difficult too. So a small group of us got together and I was pretty entrepreneurial, I have to say, you know, if I'd gone into something else, I realized now that I actually was quite business minded. I thought, well, you know, if I'm having difficulty getting in somewhere, why don't we set up our own place? And so so a group of us got together and it was three men and three women, unheard of. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we set up a little set of chambers and we found a junior clerk to come and join us and, uh, and to look after our, if you like, our diaries and making sure we got to the right place at the right time, the right courts. And we started then getting work from pretty low level things. You know, the, the, the law centre movement had started and we got work from high street law firms where you know, people that we had studied with had become solicitors. And, um, and I had uh, um, some flatmates, one of whom was a community um, uh, worker in the Waterloo area. And she got me to, you know, which she said there were lots of legal problems. And we set up a free um, advice center in the evenings. And, uh, and through that, I got to know other, other lawyers who were solicitors. They were all just in training too, and they were doing their articles. And then they started putting small cases in my direction. And that was how you built up a practice. And so, I, I try, you know, I always think that women in many ways often have to find other routes to in their success. And I used to always say, um, the routes that women have to take is sometimes not up the, the carpeted main staircase, but out the window and up the drain pipe. And that was <laughs> that was that was in some ways what, what we did was we went off, we set up our own little set of chambers, they then grew, we became better known for our work, and then we started doing lots and lots of different kinds of work. Mm -hmm. Now, I am um, uh, also at that time became very conscious of the ways in which the system didn't work for women. And, um, and that was one of the women who was yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm talking about my clients, you know, I, you'd go to court with some woman who, you know, had shoplifted or whatever, and, um, or was fiddling her social security. And it was often because she'd been left by some, you know, recalcitrant man who'd left her with a whole lot of kids, and she was not able to survive very well. And, and, uh, and so um, sometimes it led to her um, um, conduct that was of course it was committing criminal offenses but was it right to send her to prison and her children then to be taken into care and uh, and then to lose her council flat or whatever it was and the huge consequences in social terms were were um, ridiculous but it was particularly problematic for women mm. i came across, started coming across you know women who'd been really abused in their relationships with men or being brought up in households where there was uh, serious uh, domestic violence. And domestic violence at that time was not taken seriously. It was, you know, it was considered not even a crime, you know, and the police would roll their eyes and say, oh, for heaven's sake, get them to kiss and make up and, and go home. And, uh, and it, was, it was as though it was something that was um, a social problem and it only belonged in some classes and that it was, uh, you know, a problem of people drinking too much. And of course, that's not true. We now have a much greater understanding yeah. of the dynamics here and that it's about often control and power in, in relationships and about, about how often women can it, you know, be abused mm -hmm. in many different ways. And mental abuse can be as grievous as physical abuse. And do you think and, that's uh, something that has changed that. massively in the, in, the, in, this, in the period from when you've started till now? Yeah. Or is it still a difficult situation in the courts? Oh, it's still it's still a problem. I mean, we're still you know the great thing is 
from that time and uh, and the, the 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 work that I mean I, I you know women did I mean, and it was women giving voice to this and persuading women to not to be uh, prepared to put up with it mm -hmm. that we that we started hearing women being prepared to step forward but it's been a long old journey and uh, we're just in the house of lords now passed a, a new um uh, I, I was very involved in it in this in the part of it that came to the house of lords mm -hmm. the domestic abuse bill yeah. uh, and it's now passed into to law and it has is making a, it's going to make a huge difference because there's a recognition that abuse takes many forms as well as coercive control it's about keeping women short of money it's about not letting her have friends or to yeah. connect with her own family um, it's about punishing her via her children, threatening to take the children away from her. Um, so many things. And, uh, and it can be mental abuse. It can be financial abuse. It can be so many things. And that's all now accepted and acknowledged. And it's now part of the public debate. Yeah. And that was not the case when I started at the bar. Now, you wrote your book, Eve Was Framed, in 1992, and I remember <coughs> it at the time, and it was a critique of the British legal system, and I always remember that line that was about, that you said that the legal system would be like a, is like a foreign country for lots of, lots of people, not just women, lots of people. And um, I picked up your book, Eve Was Shamed, um, which is uh, the more re recent... Um, it, yeah, recent version, yeah. Yeah, um, and I want you to explain, because I read half of it and I don't know if it's I mean I've, I've been a tough newsroom journalist but I actually found it really upsetting and really half maddening and half kind of surely we have come a lot further than this so can you first of all explain the difference in the title because I think shame is a really interesting concept with women and um and what is still wrong why you know if we've, we've come so far in some ways but what is there still to do what why haven't we come further, I guess, is the question. Well, you know, um, Deborah, uh, I, I, I wrote the book in 1992, and by that time I, I was a Queen's Council. I'd just been made a Queen's Council, so I was recognised as being one of the senior women at the bar. Mm -hmm. and, and it gave me enough authority that yeah. it wouldn't be laughed off to actually say there's a problem. There's a problem here because of the way in which women are still not believed if they dress inappropriately they drink too much it's as if they've got it coming to them and therefore they've got no um uh, they won't get redress if they're raped or gang raped or whatever the, the assumption will be that she she's it's her own fault yeah. and, and and so the book was written then and it was very controversial and i was always appearing on uh, radio and television programs with old judges who said that it was all not true and were terribly kind to women um and uh and 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 we then we, the, the, we really started galvanizing support however it, it i brought it up to date 10 years later mm. because you know change was taking place um it gets my publishers come to me in, in you know 2017 i think it was and said to me you know what about bringing it up to date again and so i started doing that usually then that's a sort of you know mm. a piece of work that you do over maybe three or three or four months I started working on it and then it was during the point when I was just pulling it together the changes that had taken place and so on when suddenly the Harvey Weinstein thing happened uh, yeah and it was a really seminal moment really because you then got the me too movement that followed of women saying you know these things have happened to me in my workplace yeah Things have happened to me wherever they are you know and women around the world you know started using the internet and that was the big change yeah. the internet gave women a tool to communicate with each other and to the world about what what they experienced in their daily round yeah. and uh and, and and what came through was that we that women were made to feel such shame yeah. as if it was their fault that in fact shame is one of the things that has kept women um in their place you know because to you know, whether it was the bbc or whether it was in relation to priests in the catholic church or whether it was in 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 uh, you know all walks of life in the workplace women would often feel that they, they try and mention it to somebody and to make a complaint and it would be sort of laughed off or dismissed and it happened in political parties and uh and so they, they felt they felt that they bore the shame yeah. of what should have been born should have been born by the person who abused them and so i the shame element in all of this is so important because you know the, the and it happens now you know um still yeah. the way in which um 
women are abused online, yeah. the trolling of women mm -hmm. um, uh, using the social media, um, the ways in which women will be frightened in intimacy and in a relationship with somebody that they love and they feel loves them. Uh, they have photographs taken of an intimate nature mm -hmm. and then they part company and it's going to be put online to humiliate and shame them. Yeah, yeah. To shame them. And so shaming is such an element in all of this that we as women still feel this business that it's, we must have done something to make this happen to us. And, and so that that's just... why the... the the, the new book took a different, yeah. and it is a completely new book. Um, my, 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 it's gone out in paperback as Miss Justice <laughs> because my, yeah. my publishers actually said lots of people think they've already read this book. And, uh, and, uh, yeah. and so we retitled it in paperback. And it's worth having a look at because it shows that although we've traveled yeah. and we've made some gains, they're really pretty marginal. Mm -hmm. We've still got really great problems with the criminal justice system mm -hmm. in its delivery of justice for women. And, uh, and, and that Me Too movement thing was like a brick through the windows yeah. of courthouses around the world to say, the social contract is that you're supposed to, to, to take the wrongs that happen to the public and to make sure that instead of wreaking revenge personally, that, the, that in fact the state takes it on and does it on our behalf and they're not doing it, you're not doing it for us. Yeah. And that, so that's that's what the message of this is. And mm -hmm. it's the message of my life's work, really, which mm -hmm. is that the law still fails in too many places. Mm -hmm. And we have to we have to adjust that. And we've got to remember that law was made from the perspective of men because it was men who made law. Yeah. So in the courtroom, obviously, you know, and, I, and I think and I, and I said this to you before, that a lot of um, I, I don't know how to put this, but I was a court reporter, so saw a lot of this stuff early on. But to a lot of people, you know, a lot of my friends, they pr probably haven't had that much contact with with the court. So, but they do understand. <coughs> they do understand the things about shame, about being an outsider in their professional life, and it's very nuanced. I think in in the professional life of um, you know certain attitudes, not being able to influence, and those kind of things. So. How much do you think that the court is just a kind of separate world, as you said, or is it reflective of society's kind of view of how um, women are viewed? And well, listen, yeah, I mean, it, 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 when I first wrote about all this stuff, I very deliberately did not use sort of the language of patriarchy and misogyny and so on. I didn't use those words mm -hmm. because I wanted to be talking to women like my sisters in Glasgow. I wanted to be talking to my cousins. I didn't want it to be um, that you had to be, you know, um, somebody who yeah. spent their life reading gender studies <laughs> books, you know. I wanted it to be about the experience of most women who don't have, you know, uh, and, and, and who are married to, you know, men, maybe up and down the country, there are women who are married to nice men who don't do this stuff. Yeah. Um, but there is something, even among even good guys, mm. that they don't call out the men who are saying, yeah. look at our tits and all that sort of thing. Yeah. They're not, they're not, too many men become complicit mm. by virtue of not um, realizing what this is about and how it's actually, it's about maintaining women in a subordinate position. Yeah. I mean, there is, that's what really misogyny is about. It's about men feeling entitled, entitled to be loved by women, to yeah. be, um, um, you know, serviced by women in all the many different ways that we look after them. And, and they feel entitled to that. And we bring up our boys often to, to think that they are entitled to that and that, that girls do certain things and boys do some, certain things and one of the things that we do is we do the caring the looking after yes. the feeding we take care of the households and so on we do all that stuff and we look after them sexually and so and and if even if you take that into a microcosm mm. you know so many of the things that young women now complain about and we've all experienced it yeah. you're standing at a bus stop mm. and some guy comes up and you're there and he starts wanting to chat you up mm. and uh and he uh and he speaks to the young woman and she ignores him mm. she's not interested in him she's going to actually somewhere where she's going to meet the guy that is she doesn't want to be with and he's and he's and then he gets annoyed that she's not responding to his advances and so then he starts being aggressive in who do you think you are mm. you think you're so great i wouldn't want to be with you even if you paid me you're yeah. an ugly cow yeah. 
Yeah. And then it turns nasty mm -hmm. and it starts feeling threatening to the woman. Yeah. It starts feeling as if he, at any moment he might do something to me mm. and it's getting dark and there's nobody else around. And we as women live our lives with that stuff. Yeah. And we live our lives with it, um, you know, coming home late. And here I am, I'm a woman who's now 70. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still, you know, get worried if it's too if it's very dark. Mm -hmm. I, I live somewhere where if I can't get a taxi and I come home on the underground, I, um, I, I'll walk up in the, you know, on, in the road rather yeah. than in the pavement because it's tree lined and it's, and it's dark. Mm -hmm. You know, you, we, we're, we, and we learn that from the age of 11. 10 and 11 yeah. and 12, don't yeah. go to dark places, don't be on yeah. your own. And we end up teaching our daughters that. Yeah. And we don't say to our boys, never walk too close to a young woman if she's on her own in the evening. You can feel threatening. We don't, we don't say that to our boys. And of course, it's where does the fear come from? Why are we taught that business of to be fearful? And um, Margaret Atwood, the great uh, uh, writer, um, uh, once said, uh, men are afraid of women that women might ridicule them, mm. might laugh at them. Mm. Uh, women are afraid of men because they they're afraid they might kill them. I just think and a, and that so, one, yeah. and and it's a, a shocking thing, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and and so and it's that business of some men feel such a sense of entitlement that if a woman is in any way somehow seems to spurn them, mm. they feel that that they have to assert their power. And I'm afraid I've done too many cases over the years that are absolutely rooted in that sense of entitlement. Mm. And so, yes, in our society, of course, I'm married to a, a good man. Um, but I say to him, but do you ever call out men? You know, I mean, I mean, do you ever with colleagues when they're saying horrible things? And and I think that men avoid that thing when other men are do you doing that. Know, it's, it's, but we need men. Yeah, we get. Yeah. We need them all. <laughs> do you think it's not just and it's not as often I and mean, certainly in the world I've inhabited is not so much nowadays particularly show us your tits but it's more subtle than that it's the in jokes it's the kind of um, other ways that just make you feel uh, it's like I had this the other day in a meeting um, and I'm 57 you know you think you kind of you know you're a certain age it doesn't bother you quite as much but um, just saying, oh, that's a really nice colored top you've got on. And you know, it's a harmless remark from a harmless kind of person, but there was something in it that made me feel kind of, oh, a little bit kind of um, not part of the team, you know, not part of this senior team. Um, and I, I wonder if this is more nuanced in the workplace, this kind of thing. Deborah, it really is because I've just, um... Uh, the Royal College of Surgeons just asked me, um, I was asked by the president um, to help them deal with, uh, to do a report on diversity and inclusion. Yeah. And the reason why was because senior women surgeons were saying, you know, or young women surgeons were saying, first of all, they didn't find it a very welcoming world, yeah. the world of surgery. And it's a bit like the bar. It yeah. is, it was a sort of elite profession. Um, uh, I'm married to one, so I know about <laughs> yeah. it. And uh, an elite profession, um, where and it was very much the macho end of things you have to you know really uh, and you're having to deal with a lot of risk and so it was it was not not thought of as a place for, for women yeah of course there have been very successful women surgeons but they haven't led the profession and there's only been one uh, female president in uh, um, in its whole history of 250 years or something um, one black man um, uh, in that time, one black surgeon, and but but for, for years that's not been the case, and and again this in the last election, all of the the, the board, the, the senior board, were all the officers were all men, yeah, and men of a certain age and men of a certain kind, mm -hmm. and so um, there were lots of complaints, and so they asked that I would do this review, and I, and it was very interesting because it's so so similar in fact to my own profession. And speaking to the women about how they'll be on a platform and um, and everybody else will be called Professor uh, Smythe or Professor Johnson Brown or whatever. And it would come to, 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 to the woman who's a senior professor and they say, Alison, what do you think of that? <laughs> you know, and so suddenly, yeah. suddenly yeah. you're the girl in their midst. Yeah. So you get called your first name. Yeah. 
the, the, the audience is not um, told that you're actually a professor in your field and, and the great world expert. And it's, it's a sort of thing where it seems petty to be complaining, mm. but what's going on there? Yeah. And, and, I, and it is about an assertion of some kind of, there is a little power play that goes on in those situations. And the business of saying to you, oh, Deborah, what a pretty blouse you're wearing today. It's mm. almost, it's, it's as if you're some, Anyway, and, and one of the shocking things was hearing from uh, black women surgeons, and there are not that many of them, I can tell you, but, um, but fabulous women, really terrific women, they've become consultants. Yeah. And, and they're still within the hospital, you know, they'll be working in big general hospitals. Um, people assume that they're cleaners or they assume that they're, because everybody wears scrubs now, mm. everybody wears the same sort of, you know, outfit. And they assume because of their color that they're a nurse or they're a cleaner or they're some ancillary or there's something like that. Mm. And um, and of course, everybody wears a badge now. So call me Jeannie, you know. So so of course they will. And and there's a way in which those things are difficult for women um, because to be in a group around the, the, yeah. the patient's bed and people saying, Jeannie, what do you yeah. think? Um, and, the, and then the, the patient's thinking, why is the cleaner being asked for her opinion? Yes. When in fact, she's a, she's a person with great expertise. So those things are diminishing mm -hmm. and we have, to, we, ha we have to challenge them. And, and we have to remind you them. Them there, Helena, because I just know in the this recent situation I had that you are trying to be part of a team and you're trying to, and you're dealing with what this situation I was in, we're dealing with some quite difficult issues. You're trying to push things forward. It was online as well, which isn't, you know, so great because you haven't got the interpersonal things. And you didn't, and I'm a pretty feisty person, but I thought, I don't want to keep bringing this up as a, you know, kind of because then it becomes like you're the stroppy or, and you're more of an outsider because you're being stroppy, <coughs> and, uh, you yeah. know, haven't got a sense of humor, aren't part of the team kind of yeah. dynamics. And it was, it was the first time I found that actually that was quite difficult. It was a, yeah. um, I was kept outside by, and it, it was three men and I was kept outside. And in the it end, was, uh, yeah. The, the well, when I, I had the experience where I was the head of an Oxford college. And there's not very many um, women uh, were yeah. heads of Oxford colleges at the time. Um, but funnily enough, there was another woman who was also a Scot. And she was the head of St. Hughes and I was the head of Mansfield College. And you know, the guy who was the chair of all the, all the colleges are 30 odd. And he used to confuse us. <laughs> you know, we were so few in number. <laughs> and I and I and so he once again said to, said something you know where yeah. he got us wrong and we didn't look like each other or anything and I said I know we Scots all look the same because you know <laughs> and uh, and he was very you know you've yeah. got to find kind of funny things to yeah. say um uh so that they that kind of just tread on their toe a little bit you know yeah. um and if you can do it through being funny but yeah. all I can tell you is that of course that's the thing that we suffer is that women who do you know respond to that are considered to be humorless um yeah, you know, and the battle yeah. all that yeah. a harridan a harridan and so on so so um listen you can't win yeah and then but, you know let's let's go back to the business of the outsider mm -hmm. the funny thing was because i was a scot with a scots accent i, I became mem memorable and singular <laughs> And so sometimes being an outsider can make you some be somebody that's got your own unique selling point, you know. So yeah. and I, and when I was young, they used to sort of say, "Why don't we get you know they 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 arrest some Scot, you know, <laughs> somewhere? And say, Why don't we get that Scots barrister? She'll know how to. She'll understand what you're saying, you know." So um so yeah. I always got these things when folk were arrested who were Scottish, but um. I, I think that um, uh, you can turn things that make you an outsider into an advantage yes. where you can bring something, your unique experience yeah. is important. I, I want to just say to, to women who are listening, yeah. when we want to talk about diversity, mm -hmm. is that a fabulous piece of work was done by McKinsey, yes. um, the great sort of management consultants and so on. And they did a piece of work for the, for the corporates and for the financial sector on uh, um, diversity. And they, they, they found that in companies which were really div diverse and had diverse leadership on their boards, yeah. that in fact, you could, you could <coughs> increase your financial 
um, success by something like a third, yeah. by having that diversity. And the reason why is not because of just how it should look to the world. It's about the fact that having people from different experiences, mm. um, different walks, you know, different backgrounds, mm. creates a sort of spark of new ideas. You, you, you think in often in different ways. And by bringing that together, you can actually, it can be a catalyst for real change. Mm. And, uh, and also it's about knowing audiences or, or consumers mm. that, 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 and how to reach certain consumers with the messaging. There's all sorts of things that diversity enriches um, uh, boards and bodies and institutions with. And it's yeah. exactly the same wherever you are, that the more you have diversity, the more you spend time learning from each other, the better the, the, the outcomes and the ideas that, are, that come yeah. through it. So, um, um, we, we, you know, and we as women, you know, also have to recognize that, um, that we too are diverse. You, know, you and I are not the same, our experience is different. Um, and we can bring those elements of difference into deliberation. And so having one woman judge and having one token woman, yeah. that's not gonna do it. Yeah. And almost invariably they'll choose somebody um, yeah. that they think is going to be a pushover and sometimes yeah. that woman is a pushover because she's the token because yeah. she doesn't want to be a pain in the in the neck you know so she ends up being one of the boys um and uh and you can but, learn to play the game you know just, as women we can learn to do it like the guys but let's try and do it our way because that's something that I, I have always admired about you and a number of the guests that we we have on and have uh, particularly high profile women and one thing that really always captured me about you is this kind of this idea of kind of rocking the boat, but with a bit of humor and a bit of a kind of um, um, and there was a, a phrase I picked up the other day that we need more diplomatic disruptors. <laughs> and you have chosen to stay in the system to change within the system yeah. and other people choose to do it different ways. But can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think this is so helpful to women who are you know, facing kind of um you know trying to influence and, and it's difficult that and I, you say about the humor what what else is it how, how have you stayed so kind of resilient strong but you've still got that heart you haven't shut down and you haven't become like one of the boys I, I, well, I think I think I think it's partly about listen I was brought up in a big family of girls we were, there were four daughters um, and uh, and my mother was a, a really remarkable and, and lovable woman, and um, and 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 I think that um, my family in Scotland, um, my, my mother particularly, kept me fairly grounded. I mean, you know, I wasn't to get too big for my boots. You know, we were brought up to feel that we should never look down on people because although we were working yeah. class, um, my mother worked very hard to make sure that we were, you know felt good about ourselves and she um, uh, polished and scrubbed in order to make sure that we presented well to the world and didn't feel that we were lesser. And she always would say to us, you know, you, you must never look down on anybody else. Yeah. Um, because of course we weren't well off, but there were people who were much poorer than us. And, you know, we were a family and my father uh, was, you know, supported his family and so forth. Although we weren't, um, we didn't have any sort of, uh, um, you know riches or anything but she always said to me nobody's better than you yeah we, and and she and she herself felt that about everybody nobody intimidated my mother and uh <laughs> so, it was, yeah. and so i think that, that i think you can do it with warmth yeah. and I, I although i can disagree with people mm. i usually can see why they might feel something um mm. what, where they might be coming from and so and i i always try to retain my warmth um even if i'm in 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 battle with somebody how do you get hurt of course, mm. of course i do um, um of course i do i mean i i i i the stories that people don't tell but i always decide that it's far better to just you know be be be, be, be frank about the things that you experience um i mean obviously uh, um you're protective of of people that because I would hate ever to hurt people. You see, for example, um, you know, uh, I, of course I experienced like most women, mm. sexual harassment when I was a young woman mm. um, uh, or people being a bit predatory and so on, older men. Some of them became judges and some of them were judges. Mm. Um, but I would never name people 
because yeah. that person has a wife and he's got children and, mm -hmm. and why hurt their memory of their father or whatever I, so I would never name people yeah. um who, who did things that were inappropriate in relation to me but if you were a young a young woman in the in my profession mm -hmm. then um it was inevitable mm -hmm. that um people would try to take advantage of you and, and the like mm -hmm. um I um but I remember once I was on uh, Women's Hour or something, and uh, I was talking about sexual harassment and how in our society that women have to put up with this stuff. And we, I think we just created um, a sort of recognition of, of harassment and stalking as, as being contrary to law. But so whoever was interviewing me said to me, were you ever sexually harassed? You know, have you ever been sexually harassed at the bar in your profession? And I said, yes, of course it goes on in my profession. And yes, of course I have. But, um, you know, um, uh, it, it goes on in the shop floor. It goes on in factories and it goes on in grand places, too. Um, so I said that the next day I was at the Old Bay. I was doing a trial at the Old Bailey and I go into the robing, the, 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 the bar mess. You can tell by how these we didn't have a canteen. We had a bar mess. You know, so <laughs> the bar mess in my in my gear. And uh and there's a long table at the front where all the prosecutors and treasury council and so on would sit. And I go to get my coffee and, and one of them, the senior one says, what's all this about sexual harassment? And so I said, I said, yeah, of course. I said, y you know uh, uh, that, how that went on. And, uh, and he said to me, who would sexually harass you? And he was saying this in front of this big gang of maybe 20 right. men. Yeah, yeah. And it was basically saying to me, you're not pretty enough to be sexually harassed. Yes, yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and of course, what we as women know is, listen, you know, you can have two breasts and two legs and a behind and you can be sexually harassed <laughs> in the world. <laughs> yes, I mean, yeah. It, it, and it's not about yeah. that. It's about, in yeah, fact... Yeah, there's a, a real nastiness in that comment. Yeah, yeah. there's something else yeah. going on, you know, yeah. sometimes. How did you it, deal with that? that how, what did you do? What did you well, do? I, 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 I just sort of did a... Uh, oh and got my coffee but of course I was hurt yeah. and I was humiliated yeah. in front of a lot of people that I was being told that I wasn't because there was a lot of laughter you see because yeah, he yeah. was former and yeah. then there's a lot of you know, oh, you know. Yeah. and and so of course you're hurt yeah but you don't ever show your hurt um yeah. but of course you felt, you felt demeaned and you and then you and, and as a sort of eating at your confidence yeah. I was probably only about 33 or 34 at the time yeah. but and I never had any difficulty in getting boyfriends and men friends or anything of that sort. But <laughs> yeah. still, we as women carry those things. Yeah. Of course, yeah. I'm not as pretty as everybody else. And yeah. you're not allowed to say that you're sexually harassed because they'll just laugh at you. Yes, and especially so somebody you, like you, who, to hear that from somebody like you, I think you'd be very empowering for other, you know, I mean, I have heard this yeah. from daughter's friends who, who get this same thing and almost on, on social media and on, on the street as well. This idea of, you know, you're not up to what we want, what somebody expects you to be. And I wonder if I that know. could tap into that shame idea that some kind of shame that you, you know, you're not enough or something. Yes, it's, it's, it's and, and it's what happens to, to women is that you know, women politicians, if you were to see, you would be so shocked if you see, I mean, listen, young women can talk about it because it happens to, to them all the time. Yeah. But women politicians, they receive these terrible emails telling them how ugly they are, yeah. how they wouldn't have sex with them if they were paid, say the men, or they say that they will have sex with them, but they're going to do all kinds of horrible and grievous and nasty things to them. Um, and it happens to women journalists, it happens to women campaigners, it happens to any anybody who puts their head above the parapet and it's sort of saying how dare you yes yeah. and and uh and how do because that that is so this, an, an issue isn't it that that because the one thing we do a lot is coaching women to raise their voice you know because i think as soon as you stop the invisible and you stop having your say <coughs> it's really difficult so but how do you do we expect women to go into politics when you hear someone like diane abbott and the kind of like a black young black woman going into politics and you hear the kind of stuff Diane Abbott has had to live with for years on a daily basis. I don't know how you toughen somebody up enough to want to do that. It's, it's um, it, that sort of thing eats away at a person's soul. Yeah. You know, it really does. It's, the, the pain becomes 
absorbed mm. um, and 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 there's something horrifying about it I'm currently um, uh, heading up a an inquiry for the Scottish pa uh, government, Parliament, mm -hmm. into misogyny, yeah, and and and, miso and misogyny, a hate crime, mm -hmm. and um, and it's and it's about those. These are the stories that we're hearing, the bit, the bus stop story, you mm -hmm. know, that or, or, or women just going along the road, um, and somebody starts walking behind them and starts saying, uh, you know, or passes them and then starts following them and yeah. starts abusing them and following them yeah. and saying, yeah. talk to me, how dare you not speak to me? Turn around and look at me you bitch and 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 the woman's thinking is there anybody around or, you know uh, you know and the can am i all right or or could he just suddenly you know grab me from behind mm. i mean it's this is part of uh, the stuff that women are saying why should we have to live with this yeah. and it, the interesting thing is that um you know generationally this there's a new generation of of women saying enough is enough yes and they're right yes. and i think that as older women we support them yeah um and sometimes you'll hear i'll hear older women saying oh for heaven's sake you know guys whistling at this in the street or cat calling or whatever it never killed anybody mm -hmm. no it doesn't kill anybody when it sticks at that yeah. but it's the problem is that it is often the beginning of yeah. the things that then follow yeah. and um and and women are frightened of what you know ignoring it is going to mean yeah. um they bump into that guy in the street uh the following day so yeah. you know the, there are serious um uh, problems that women are facing and then just saying no we've had enough of it yeah yeah so as older women <laughs> what because it is it's something that burns so passionately for me and and i was saying to you i i live around the corner from where um sarah everard was abducted and um and felt seeing Clapham, I live in Clapham, the, the, the anger that you <coughs> feel it in the air in the street afterwards of, of you know, how women just of all ages, absolutely kind of, it ignited something, but, and, and now it's kind of gone away and it's, you know, not gone away, but it's not, it's not there in plain, you know, plain sight for everyone to see. So what can we do? What can we, because, you know, our community, I think we're good women, we want to, you know, do something with our um, wisdom, <laughs> with our time, um, with mothers of daughters, and so how, how and sons as well, because we, as, as you've said, bringing boys into this we, we have to, yeah. What, because we're, and the, the other thing I noticed is there's so many of us out there that are kind of well-meaning, want to do something, want to get our hands dirty, pull up sleeves up, what can we do to? Well, you know, listen, there's the large and the small. I spend yeah. my time now, I mean, I, a lot of my work is international now, and, mm -hmm. and, and you know, the, the gross manifestations of this are where, you know, you have conflicts, and mm -hmm. now, it, now it's been spoken about, which it yeah. wasn't in the past, yeah. the business of of raping women yeah. uh, in, in these terrible conflicts. So there's those yeah. manifestations yeah. are, yeah. we'll punish the women, we will take you yeah. and we will remind you who's who's got yeah. the power here. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's the gross stuff at one end, or then you have the business of what happened to Sarah Everard, you know, um, but then it goes right down to the to the to the, to the, the lesser end of it. But it's it's a sort of continuum. Yes. And we must, as women, recognize this. And so when we hear our women talking about the mm -hmm. things that make them fearful, it's very easy for us who are quite confident women yes. to, to say, you know, oh, for heaven's sake, you know, do you know what's going on in the world? I mean, we're not talking rape here. However, yeah, yeah. We, we've got to we've got to see the, the continuous nature of this stuff. We've also got to see that, I mean, if if we are comfortably off women, you know, we have options open to us that many women don't have, mm. um, which is of taking taxis of, you know, uh, yeah. um, uh, basically, you know, we have a car and we're kind of safe in it as long as, you know, when we get put the locks down and thing and we, we have, we're self-contained in vehicles. What happens when you're a woman who is dependent on public transport, who is a, a young person where money isn't uh, readily available? where you also have the confidence of thinking that somehow you're invulnerable and then something happens. And I have this vision of Sarah Everard as being a young woman who, you know, it was, it was, she'd, she'd gone across the, the, the from yeah. where she was living. She'd visited a friend and she thought, I'll get my hours of exercise and walk home. Yeah, yeah. It no, wasn't no, late. People with walk all the time. Yeah. Nine yeah. And, and, uh, and, and, and then 
something happens. Yeah. And what we know is that somehow or other, uh, she was take, taken in a vehicle and taken somewhere. Did did someone, the being a police person, did he sort of say, you shouldn't be walking at night. This is not safe. I'm a police officer. Let me give you a lift back to Brixton. Mm -hmm. And you're breaking the curfew or some damn thing. And therefore, you know, get her into the vehicle falsely. Or was she beaten so that she was not conscious? How do we know? Do we know? Um, yeah. the, trial will, the trial will bring us information and, and we'll see, obviously, it's not for me to be passing any kind of judgment before a trial. Yeah. However, it, 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 the, the, the thing, those events feed the fear of, of other women, yeah. of all yeah. of us. And remind and, 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 yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so when you ask the question, what do we do? Mm -hmm. I think that we do have to be making demands for yeah. uh, greater protections, greater life, all those things. But yeah. it, we start saying it's not us who have to be fixed. Yeah, it's not women who have to be fixed. That we have to we have to always be the people who alter our behaviour. That we have to do the things. We have to have conversa a better conversation with men about their responsibilities and their responsibilities in relation to other men. Um, yeah. I'll tell you, Deborah, a, a, a little story. I, I've been saying to my, having these discussions around my dinner table, and I yeah. have two grown up sons and a grown up daughter and a son in law and so on, and a husband. And so we're talking about all of this. And my son was telling me that he was on the bus and, uh, and he saw, and the bus was virtually empty because it, um, it was COVID. And he, he, um, and he saw a young woman sitting up in the front and he saw this guy come on the bus and sat down in the middle. And then he spotted that there was the young woman further up and he gets up and he moves up and he sits right down beside her. You know, the whole of the bus is virtually empty and he goes and he sits right down beside her. And my son Roland could see from his face that he was speaking at her yeah. and she kept looking ahead. Yeah. And she obviously didn't want to engage with him. Mm -hmm. Probably he was reeking of alcohol or something. Yeah, yeah. But, um, and so uh, Roland, mindful of what I was saying, walked up the bus and he said to the young woman he said is this uh is this man troubling you and she nodded at him mm. and he said look why don't you there's a, there's plenty of room on the bus why don't you just yeah. leave her she, she she doesn't want you sitting with her and of course then he started abusing my son it says, <laughs> you have to be quite brave <laughs> to do that don't and you so, and so it's, yeah. it isn't easy for men no, to take these positions no. And it might have been easier if there had been other men on the bus who might have there. But he said suddenly he was feeling the full heat of this guy's sort of yeah. who are you to be, what's the businesses of yours and all that. Mm. Anyway, um, uh, the, the uh, Roland pressed the button on the bus and went down the stairs and, uh, and spoke to the, um, the, the bus driver and the bus driver got the guy off the bus. Yeah. But, it, but it is hard. We're yeah. making requests of our main folk to do things which often can put them at risk too. Yeah, yeah. Helen, I've spent so much of your time and I've talked to you all night. It's been absolutely fantastic. A very, very fine. So finally, if you could wave a magic wand and do something in the world that would make the world a better place for women, what would it be? What would that single thing be? Well, listen, it, 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 that's, a, that's a seriously difficult one. But I mean, I mean, what we're really talking about here, and I mean, I'm, I'm a lawyer who's now described as a human rights lawyer. Um, and, and, and I just want to say to everybody, human rights actually matter. And they've been yeah. it's been really important having a, that, a discourse about human rights available to us as women, because it's allowed us to, to challenge lots of things. Yeah. Uh, human rights law has really been a, a very important for the victims, women as victims of crime and so on, to get inquests for, for when women have been murdered, to get inquests, um, uh, inquiries into things that have happened to women. Yeah. Uh, from from meshes being put into women's, uh, to stop them uh, that, you know, when they've had urinary tract problems and things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Things. Yeah. Lots of things where you can have judicial review and invoke the Human Rights Act. So let's not forget that as women, how what an important tool it has been. Yeah. But the thing that I would say is, it's, it's about trying to make the argument for respect, yeah. for yeah. real respect and human dignity. And uh, and we and we and I, if I had a magic wand, I would say, all we want is to be treated genuinely as yeah. equal. Yeah. Eleanor, that's so great. Thank you so much for your time. Today. Well, it's lovely that you do this, Deborah, because I do think that um, 
it's uh, it's been one of the great revelations of the of the of the pandemic has been the creation of great podcasts with fabulous <laughs> women like you the opportunities for people yeah. to, to 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 listen when they're out for their walk or whatever and, yeah. and to, to to hear discussions yeah. um I'm afraid I've done most of the talking today, but I am um, <laughs> just, it's, it's an opportunity to talk about some of the things that, that yeah. actually it can seem small yeah. um, in, in our, our lives, but actually which, which together over time can actually take away women's confidence. And, and uh, those and little things, isn't it? It's that loads of us and what can we, those little things that, you know, I mean, you do the big things on the international stage, which is kind of, but those little, how, how we can all just do our little bit to contribute to, you see, this is one of the great event, event uh, uh, you know, inventions of, of modern technology. Yeah. But I do think, and particularly for our children, yeah. and particularly you know, for our boys and girls at, of school age, that the, 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 the whole business of social media can yeah. be a real detriment uh, in the terms of their development. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't a particularly pretty little girl, and I'm sure that, that I wouldn't be getting thumbs up and so on, and I would be feeling miserable um, uh, about not being liked enough or whatever, because it, it's all just you know, how you look. And so, and, and you've got serious depression amongst teenagers, uh, you know, and adolescents, self-harming, suicidal thoughts, horrible things because they're, they think they're yeah. not meeting whatever it is that are the standards that are being set. And boys seeing so much pornography at such a young age. Yeah. So that's another wish I would have is another that uh, I'd, like, to keep I'd like something done about the internet. Yes, yes. <laughs> Helena, thank you so much for your time. Have a great Definitely. evening. <laughs> nice seeing you. All the best.